We'll start with uh, Nicolas Cantor. Go ahead. Coach, can you hear me? I can, Nico. How you doing, bud? Good. And yourself? Good. Hey, so it's probably very difficult to answer questions towards something almost a year from now. Um, but there's a lot, right, in, in 2021. And priori prioritizing competitions is, is definitely going to be an issue for, for you guys. Um, where does this gold cup rank i know that world cup qualifiers obviously is probably most important but olympics are there as well that's another curveball into the mix um and i know you want to win everything so rather than where does the gold cup rank i actually want to ask you how do you juggle with with all these competitions you know that, that's a great question nika and one thing i would say is that um you know there are a lot of competitions and what that means is it's opportunity for players um it's opportunity for players to show that they they belong that they, they should be part of the first team so to speak so um you know no matter what competition we're in every time the players step on the field they they prove that they they can wear the jersey and that they want to be part of the starting group, the squad, whatever that may be. But the CONCACAF Gold Cup represents the premier tournament in our confederation, um, and it's a chance to win a trophy. And this, this is a young team that, that hasn't won a trophy yet, so we're certainly going to be, be trying to accomplish that in this tournament. Hi, Greg. Thanks for doing this. Um, we, we just spoke to John Herman, who mentions you know, how challenging the kind of congested calendar is going to be next year. What are you kind of anticipating in terms of how you're going to deal with clubs and maybe how you might have to change your squad uh, between windows just with the amount of games you're facing? Yeah, well, that would be exactly it. You know, it's going to be good communication. Um, it's going to be looking at a lot of different players. It's going to, it's going to be juggling some players in, in certain cases. But, you know, the next, next year, 2021, represents a chance to win two trophies with the Nations League and the CONCACAF Gold Cup. And then to get a really good start in qualifying, you know, it looks like we're going to be playing, um, you know, eight games in, in 2021 of qualifying. So that's a big chunk of games that we can, we can make a dent on starting to reach some of our goals of qualifying for the World Cup. Greg, it's Jeff Carlo here. Um, thanks for doing this. Mm -hmm. um, how you talked about it's a balancing act and, but just in terms of getting guys released, I mean, especially like with the Olympics and then all these competitions kind of piling on, you know, how, how difficult is that going to be? Well, the clubs are obligated to release the players for the, for this event. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, whenever the, the release date is, it may be June 28th that, you know, the clubs are obligated to release the players to us. This represents more than that. It represents relationships and work and communication and really talking to the clubs and, and, trying to piece together what makes most sense for the player. You know, if I asked you, is it reasonable for a player to play a whole season, then go to Nations League, then go to Gold Cup, then start preseason again without a break, you know, it's probably not reasonable for that. So we're going to have to juggle the squad a little bit. We're going to, um, you know, still be competing for, for trophies, but there will be a certain amount of juggling we need to do. Brian, please unmute yourself. I did. Hello, Greg. Hey, Brian. How's it going, um, man? It's going okay. Um, did the shift in schedule, moving the, the, the Nations League to June and then bumping, excuse me, the start of qualifying from before the Gold Cup to after the Gold Cup, change your calculus at all about how you want to use the Gold Cup? It, it, may, be, it may be your first chance to get sort of your A team together uh, before qualifying as opposed to before. If qualifying started before the Gold Cup, it would have made maybe more sense to rest guys during that period. So I'm just wondering how you're – your outlook toward the tournament has changed as a result of that schedule shift? Well, we're, it's something we're definitely considering, Brian. Um, when you think about getting the, uh, what you just said, getting our, the whole group together, right? We'll have an opportunity in March to do that. Um, we'll have an opportunity in June to do that. And then the Gold Cup could be an opportunity. And then, you know, then it's qualifiers. So, you know, either way, um, you know, it, it's still looking at the player's workload and the player's schedule. And we have to be mindful of that. That's really important in this whole process. But we certainly want to get our group together. We want to get our group playing together before qualifying. Thank you. Um, Greg, kind of piggybacking on all these questions, um, we'll switch from kind of the, the guys everyone's thinking about, um, you know, Christian, Tyler, all those guys, and, and easing their workload to the Olympic group. If you do qualify, 
how do you measure um, guys who could potentially be captains or standouts at the Olympics versus guys who are trying to fight into the first team to potentially use the Gold Cup as a place to, to say, hey, I, I belong at, at World Cup qualifiers? You know, Paul, I don't even know how to answer that question. I really don't, just because of it's, it's not cut and dry. It's not clear, right? If, if you talk about an opportunity for a young player to go to the Olympics and, and you know, compete for a medal in the Olympics, it's a, it's a tremendous honor. And, um, you know, it happens every four years. So, you know, it, it's going to, again, it's going to come down to working really closely with Jason, um, looking at our player pool, looking at um, the workload of the guys and then, and then trying to make the best decision possible. And, uh, and we won't get everyone right. I, I know that, but by and large, we want to make really good decisions to make sure every team has both the opportunity to, to win a, um, a trophy. And then we're also being mindful of, of what the players have been doing. Thanks, uh, Greg, Jonathan, Tannenwald, the hey, Philadelphia Inquirer. I hope all's well with you. Um, Look, it's been a while since the national team program has played. And at this point, given all the circumstances, I know you guys want to get together in November in some form, but does it feel odd to, to think about how long it's been and, and not being certain of when it might next be, despite everyone's best efforts, hopes, and whatnot? You know, I mean, part of the uncertainty is what we're dealing with in our everyday lives, right? I mean, nothing feels certain anymore, right? Um, and, and that's just something we have to adapt to. We have to be flexible. We have to make the best possible de decisions with the information we have. And we have to plan. And then when we plan, if something doesn't go our way, we have to, we have to use an alternate plan and, um, and keep going. But you know, it is, it is challenging for international managers right now with the lack of playing time. It's great to see Europe back playing um, internationally. Hopefully South America will, will get going again also. And, you know, world soccer has to restart again. And, um, you know, we need to look, to what, we need to look for ways to, um, to do that. And uh, we're, we're doing that now. Uh, hi, Greg. Michael from AFTN. Um, just kind of following on from what Jonathan said there, could you maybe talk us through what does an average week look like for you just now? Is it just a lot of looking at players and trying to work out who you might want to bring in or what is it like on a week to week basis? So what we're doing is we're, we're actually as a staff, we're in the office twice a week, um, Monday and thir uh, sorry, Wednesday and Thursday, but Monday is used for um, scouting individually. So we have, a, we're all signed to watch players. You know, we have a ton of players in the MLS, ton of players in Europe, all playing and, and we're watching them carefully. Tuesdays when we have a call and we recap all the performances of the players. Um, we have a, a scouting platform that we use to do that. They're all evaluated. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, we're in the office working on, um, you know, our game model type of things, working on, um, watching opponents, watching phases of play of other teams, just getting deep into soccer. And then Friday, we have another call to end the week. Uh, and then on the weekend, we're watching games again. So, you know, it, it's a cycle where you'd like to have the tension of preparing for an opponent, of preparing the team to play, of picking a squad. But unfortunately, we don't have that at the moment. So we have to make the best of it. Uh, Greg, uh, you, you mentioned game model. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little about just with all this time that you have, um, how, how is your kind of approach evolving in this time with all the street time normally as a coach you use you use games and training sessions to kind of help you kind of see how your model fits the players and vice versa but you don't have these games do you see your your model do you see your your philosophy uh, adapting or evolving as you watch players as you watch games other coaches in Europe and whatnot I mean is it evolving even though you don't have games to to, to use you know that game, Football Manager Hives? That's, I've been playing that every single day and, and competing in that and setting new formations. And No, I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, it's, it's challenging, right? It's, it's like you, you're, you become a coach in theory now um, and not in reality. And that's the challenging part of it. But it's about studying now, I think, watching trends of the game, watching what teams are doing, watching, you know, our players really carefully. Um, you know, you can still be productive. Uh, it's just we're, we're not getting the reps on the field and we're not getting the game reps. But in terms of studying the game, you, you can still do that with, with plenty of video and, and keeping. I think the most important thing is keeping current on our player pool, knowing exactly what they've been doing. 
Hi, Greg. I, I, we've seen a lot of American players, particularly young ones, seize the opportunities presented by a, a busy fixture list here in MLS with the, the season restart. Um, who has if caught your eye? What's your take on the, the rising prominence of some of these young Americans, particularly in, in attacking positions? And, and could that provide opportunities for them maybe faster than we're accustomed to seeing them on the national team level? Well, I mean, one thing I, I think is with these opportunities, the, the, the players are going to be faced with challenges that they're either going to have to rise to or succumb to. And you see a lot of players ri rising to the occasion and rising to the challenges. And, you know, it, it wasn't that common that such young players um, are, are playing out in MLS. You look at Moses Nyman from D.C., look at Ke Kevin Paredes, you know, Griffin Yao. I mean, this, those are good examples of young players, um, you know, making a good impact in the league. Um, you know, other teams as well. Brendan Aronson, obviously, is an established player already at, at his age. It's, it's great to see what he's doing. Mark McKenzie's been doing a fantastic job. So it's just for us keeping track of these guys. Um, you know, the, the player pool that we're scouting now is actually expanded because we want to make sure we're getting every, every guy who, who has an opp opportunity to play. And it's just been fun to watch them. Hey, Greg, thanks for doing this. Just want to get you on the record quickly on, on Canada, John Urban talked about how those games last fall sort of ignited the rivalry. How, how do you see that matchup uh, and that rivalry that's uh, developing with Canada? Yeah, I mean, guys, the thing is, is when we played them, you know, even prior to the game in Canada, I, t I, I was saying to the media that this is a very good generation of players that they, that they have. I mean, like, it's, it's a really good time for Canadian football. I mean, Alfonso Davies is obviously spearheading that whole effort, but then you look at Jonathan David, who's, who's an excellent player. You look at um, Cavallini, who's an excellent player. You look at uh, Rich Larea, what he's been doing. You look at, um, you know, Scott Arfeld, who's a really good soccer player. Then they have Jonathan Osorio. And, you know, it's a, it's a good team. And I've said that all along. Jonathan, uh, uh, Mark Anthony Kay is is excellent player. So they have talent. And it's just for them about putting it together and, and competing as a team. And they've, and they've been shown to, to be making progress on that. So they were two challenging games when we played them. Um, you know, they kicked our butt up in Toronto and, and we beat them pretty good in Orlando. And we're looking forward to playing them in the Gold Cup because we know it's going to be a really competitive game. Great. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you for your time.